So welcome to part 28.4 of A-Level Physics, which is sensing devices. And this is quite a simple one, which is really, you know, in the last um, video we talked about how op amps can be used as sensors to detect changes in the environment. And this is um, going to be talking about how we can kind of actuate um, our sensors so that we can, um, when we sense something, that we can produce an output. And basically we're going to be looking at three different things today. Relays, LEDs, and also um, digital and analog meters. So let's start with relays. Relays are basically, um, if you imagine, a switch. So, you know, at home, basically you have a kind of, you know, you have your light switch on the wall. And what happens when you flick it? Uh, the light goes on. And you flick it again, and the light goes off. And a relay is exactly the same thing, only this works in an electronic circuit, and it works through kind of um, uh, physical means. So, to demonstrate this, I think it would be most appropriate to show a picture of a relay. And here it is right here. It's literally a lot of wires wrapped around together in a tight coil. And you might be thinking, you know, how does a bunch of wires tightly wound around each other, uh, how is it able to act as a switch in a circuit? So, you know, we kind of, we kind of, when we do a circuit, we kind of have this idea of this kind of switch, which, you know, we know exists, but we don't really know how it works. It might be a light switch, but you know, we can actually automate this with a relay coil. And basically the circuit of um, something like that is really quite simple. It's, uh, we have our op amp here, and we're just going to draw the output. And imagine, because you've seen the other stuff enough times to know what's going on. And here we're going to have a diode, and this diode is critically important to what we were trying to do. And it comes down, and we're going to have our relay coil, and then we have our earth. And our earth goes all the way out. And over here we have a second diode. And I'm going to give these diodes names. I'm going to call this diode uh, diode uh, 0. And I'm going to call this diode diode 1. Alright, fantastic. So how does this work? Well, we know that the output of a op amp can be either positive or negative. And I'm going to kind of assign uh, colors to this. So let's say the positive arrow is orange. Uh, and the negative arrow is, uh, say, green. So when it flows negatively, we can say it flows in this direction here. It flows towards the op amp. And when it flows positively, it flows away from the op amp. As you can see, the diode here serves a purpose that only when the um, output is positive that this diode allows current through to pass through the coil. So as you can see, when it's negative, um, the current actually can't flow at all. The, current, the resistance of this is so high that the current becomes basically negligible. So what happens when this activates? Uh, well, as you might know, if, you've, um, if you're familiar with magnetism, as I imagine most of you probably are, this will could produce a magnetic field. And over here next to it is a second circuit. And I'm going to draw this circuit in pink. And this circuit is basically a circuit with a switch. And this leads to some other circuit. And this circuit can have anything it wants. It can have a large current and it can be, you know, it can be pretty much anything. It could, uh, uh, it could be a washing machine, it could be a, a heater in your room, it could be a computer, it could be anything. And basically, when the op amp senses it's positive, so maybe when, when the positive signal is greater than the negative signal, um, this op amp will switch the switch because this diode only allows positive signals through. And then it will make this switch go from the open position to the closed position. And this is kind of actually literally a metal contact that when a magnetic field is created, it experiences a force which cr closes a circuit and literally completes it. And a few things to note about this. Because this is an uh, exterior circuit, because there's actually no links between this circuit and this circuit, two separate circuits, there is no current that flows between them. And because of that, you know, op amps are very fragile devices. A lot of op amps can only handle uh, uh, currents in the kind of scaled to about 20, 25 milliamps. And, you know, maybe our washing machine runs on 240 volts. So as you can see, it would be evident that we obviously should not connect these, uh, sorry, 250, uh, 250 volts and maybe 2 amps or 3 amps. And it would be foolish to try and connect these. It would just, you know, cause so much damage. And this one is really dealing with, uh, this one on the left is dealing with kind of intricate, delicate, small sensors, and this one is, might be dealing with, you know, huge industrial applications. So that's one really good thing about this being separated. Another thing is, 
if we consider what happens when a magnetic field closes, right? So, you know, we have a magnetic field being produced here, and uh, what happens when this magnetic field gets dissipated? So, you know, uh, also, it's important to know that when a current starts flowing through here, it also starts generating its own magnetic field. So we have a whole lot of magnetic fields, but when this op amp stops being positive, this coil stops creating a magnetic field, and therefore, when this coil stops creating a magnetic field, something happens. We get back EMF. And I believe we talked about this briefly, but this is um, back to Lenz's Law. In Lenz's Law, um, just a quick refresher, is uh, the negative number of coils times the change in the magnetic potential. Sorry, not, not magnetic potential, magnetic flux over change in time. So basically, you know, because we're losing... Basically, this is to say, um, it's kind of like Le Chatelier's equilibrium principle. The system always tries to oppose the change. And because we suddenly we went, we, we went from having a lot of uh, magnetic flux to having no magnetic flux in a very short time, we get a whole bunch of back EMF trying to change that. So, um, and the, you know, when this was still on, the polarity of this was positive on, uh, and on the side, on the top, and negative on the bottom. Because when the, because we think, when we think about conventional current, we think of a charge carrying particles to have a positive charge. And they go through the positive side, and then they lose, as they go towards the negative, they kind of slide into a low energy state, because positive and negatives enjoy being together. And when they slide into that low energy state, they give up their energy into this coil, and that's what creates a magnetic field. Now, when the magnetic field is cancelled, the magnetic field kind of doesn't like the fact it's being cancelled, and it wants to retain itself, so it tries to build up current back into this, in the same direction, current still flowing downwards, so that this magnetic field can kind of try and regenerate itself. And when that happens, the polarity of it actually swaps, this side becomes negative, and this side becomes positive. And the reason is, this is no longer a lamp or a resistor like you might think of it. This is now a power source, it's now generating the power. And it goes the same direction, except it goes this way. And normally, this might go through, and this might generate a huge EMF, because we're taking out a lot of magnetic flux all in a very short time. And that's what D1 comes in. So D0 acted as a kind of check to make sure that the current was in the right sign, so that only when this current uh, output current was positive that this would turn on. But D1, what happens is when this back EMF happens, it conducts that back EMF and within itself, and it acts like a heating element. I mean, this could literally just be a resistor. But a resistor, the problem with a resistor, is it would um, draw current away um, even when the... Sorry, it's just a very um, busy diagram now, but I'm trying to use one more color, let's use purple. Um, if it was a resistor, when the current comes down, it would split both directions. But because it's a diode, this on the diode only functions when um, when back EMF is produced. And what it does is it kind of acts as a it acts as a resistor. It conducts and dissipates all the energy from the back EMF, so that this circuit can shut down, go um, go into its off position without damaging this um, potentially expensive and delicate op amp. So that's how switches work. Hopefully it wasn't too complicated. And now we're going to talk about LEDs, which I've actually already talked about in the last video when I talked about um, a potential use of comparators. And I'm just going to do that really briefly in a short um, kind of, you know, uh, hopefully one or two minute explanation. And here it is. Here's our op amp, and it comes out, and we might have some predict protective, um, we might have some protective uh, resistors here. And, you know, that's pretty much, that's pretty much that. And there's our ground, and let's go this off. So here's our um, op amp, and let's, uh, let's make two LEDs. Let's like make an orange one facing this direction, and let's make a green one facing this direction. And like I said, it's all about positive and negatives again. It's essentially, it's similar to the switch, except the way it actuates is a bit different. And um, when I say the word actuate, actuate is really just taking, um, it's sort of like creating an output in response to some kind of stimuli. So uh, actuating a system just means creating an output into that system. So when the current is positive, and we'll say this is a positive direction, uh, sorry, I used, let's use the same convention. So let's say that this is the negative side, and let's say... Uh, blue is a positive. So when it's positive and current's flowing this way, 
uh, what, as you can see, current cannot flow down this left uh, this left side here. This cannot happen because this um, diode uh, LEDs are essentially diodes, and they only allow current to pass through one direction. They might, as you might see, um, LEDs will have a short leg and a long leg, and um, the the shorter leg here is the negative leg, and the and it's the cathode where the car current leaves. And the positive leg here is the anode where the current enters. So, you know, if you've seen an LED in real life, you'll know that they are, are biased towards one side and they only allow current to pass through one side. So in, the, in this positive state, current will only flow through green and it will create a green light to say, hey, your output right now is positive, right? And in the other case, you know, when the current is negative, uh, the current will only flow through this way. And this will only turn on the orange light. And the orange light is basically saying, hey, at this point, uh, your output is negative. And, you know, this is useful when we have comparators. And I said before, uh, you know, it can be used in uh, thermostats, toasted sandwich machines, um, timers. It can be used in anything, really, where you have kind of... Uh, one or more discrete possible, uh, well, a binary discrete possibility where the current's either positive or negative. And of course, you can build these systems upon each other and have, you know, multiple op amps. And, you know, this is just really a fundamental basis of how this works. It can get a lot more complicated than this. You might have multiple op amps, more than uh, two LEDs. And, you know, it can, you can see how it works. And basically, uh, you know, we don't really have to understand in all its complexity how larger systems of, um, circuits like this might work, but as long as you understand the core fundamental concepts behind uh, how this works, you'll be fine for uh, the scope of a CIE syllabus. And it really is quite interesting and useful to know how these things work, because you know, you might see an appliance in real life and say, hey, you know, I know how that works. So it's just a bit of a nice thought. One more, and that's uh, about analog and digital meters. And I have a bit of a picture here. Basically, what we're looking at is the use of uh, analog digital meters. I'm sure you've seen these on volt meters, maybe thermometers. And what this is saying really is it's saying that, you know, we can use more than just the binary uh, representation of the output as positive or negative. We can use the output as an actual value which might represent the temperature or the strain or, you know, all the other sensors uh, that we have. We can represent the degree to which those sensors are sensing as a voltage output. But the trouble is we can only ever get it as a voltage output, because our op amp can never output anything other than volts. And what we need is a calibration curve. So what we do is we draw a graph like this, and we take some known temperatures, say we say, okay, let's put it at 10 degrees, and 20 degrees, and 30 degrees, and measure the voltage. And once we have a lot of data plots like this, um, at each point we can kind of draw a regression uh, a model, where we just plot a line and say, okay, so if your voltage is at say 7 volts that means the temperature of your device is 15 degrees and we have to draw, a, this is called a calibration curve you might be familiar if you've done any experimental physics and we need this for um, any situation where we have uh, a new kind of where we've designed a new measurement system and what's um, nice to keep in mind is that these don't have to be linear and for example I like to take uh, a mercury thermometer, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. You might think, oh, that's, um, you know, the scales on that are, you know, pretty constant. It goes up linearly. But actually, the expansion of mercury with temperature, so let's say this is, in, in, in fact, expansion, sorry, this is, let's say that this is, in fact, temperature, and that this one here is expansion. It's actually a curve. And what, um, what, what, the reason that it looks linear on a mercury scale is that between zero degrees and 100 degrees, it's approximately a straight line. So we just we just give it a linear scale. But if you can see in this picture here, 500 to 200 has a gap of that. 150 has a gap of that. And 5 to 1 has a gap of that. So this is not a linear scale either. And you'll find a lot of the times the scales we use actually aren't linear. But that's all right, because, you know, we can deal with that. And that's where the calibration curves comes in. So as I was saying, I ho hope this was a pretty um, easy and straightforward lesson. And as always, if you enjoy these videos, please like, subscribe, and comment. That helps me out directly. And as always, I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks.